date of launch, I'm going to be thinking about how my entire life has led up to this moment. I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there is that my dad worked for the NASA tracking station. And so I feel like space has always been a part of me. When I got that call, that Zoom, and Jared was on there, and he said that, you know, they picked me for the prosperity seat, that I was going to go to space with him uh, and be part of the inspiration for, it really was like um, getting the golden ticket for Willy Wonka. Everything in my life finally came into focus and I realized that it was all about this moment in time. I won the prosperity seat for Inspiration4, and I did that not as a geoscientist or an explorer or an analog astronaut, which are all on my resume. I actually won this as a poet and an artist. We are striving for that Star Trek generation, that idea of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space, or a Jedi space. I'm gonna be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft ever. And to me, that just blows me away. And I want to encourage the next generation to dream that this is possible. And a Jedi space, that's what that's about. I'm Dr. Cyan Proctor, and I'm the mission pilot for Inspiration4. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome geoscientist and astronaut, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And you know, having that music played reminded me of when I landed and I came off the spacecraft. How many of you saw my me dancing as I uh, splashed down and walked out? And the reason why was it was such a life-changing moment for me. And it put everything that I thought of when I was a kid really into focus. And so I'm thrilled to be here today to talk to you about Space to Inspire. You know, everybody has a space story, and this is mine. So I am a community college professor. I taught at South Mountain Community College in Phoenix, Arizona for over 20 years. I'm a geoscientist, and so most of the classes that I teach are geology-based and sustainability-based. Uh, and so it's been a real, you know, being a professor was something that I decided to do in grad school because when I was a teaching assistant, I realized that I had the, the ability to inspire people as a teacher. And so being a community college professor has really been a highlight of my life. And so how does that relate to space? Well, I became a college professor, but it wasn't what I wanted to do when I was a kid. I was actually born on the island of Guam. Has anybody been to Guam? Raise your hand if you've been to Guam. All right. And so I was born on Guam because my father was working at the NASA tracking station during the Apollo missions. So we were there from 1966 to 1970. And so we were there for Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon. And I was born eight and a half months after Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. So I consider myself to be a celebration baby. Do we have any other celebration babies out there? There's got to be one. Oh, someone raised their hand over there. And so I grew up with all of this really cool NASA memorabilia to my father on his office wall. So in 1970, after I was born, we left Guam, and my life in snow began because we moved to Minnesota. And, uh, and my dad wasn't working for NASA anymore. But Whenever I went into his office, there was all of these cool things, and there was this Neil Armstrong autograph that I just loved growing up and seeing that. And so my big thing was I wanted to be a military aviator and then flying the F-16, and then going off and becoming the shuttle commander and pilot, because that's the lens that I saw space through. And so I thought that that was going to be my reality, but then two things happened to me when I was 16 years old, about 15 or 16, I got glasses. And back then, you couldn't be a military aviator if you wore glasses. 
And then the second thing that happened in my life that really kind of changed things was my father, when I was in high school, got diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he passed away when I was 19. And, but my parents, neither of which had college degrees, particularly my dad, was adamant that the way to improve your life was through education. And so he, uh, from the moment I was born, encouraged me and my siblings to go and get as educated as we possibly could. And so I became Dr. Cyan Proctor. As a geoscientist, I went all the way up to my PhD <laughs> and really investing in lifelong learning. But then I became also an explorer and a science communicator, being able to share my love of the Earth, but also exploration and being an explorer, and what does that mean? And then I became an analog astronaut, living in Moon and Mars simulations. Now here's the interesting thing. Why did I become an analog astronaut? The reason why was because in 2009, well, actually, it goes back a, little, a year before that. In 2008, I got an email from a friend that said, NASA's looking for astronauts. You should apply. And I was like, I don't even know how NASA selects astronauts, because that was a dream that had died back when I was a teenager, because I had always seen the road to becoming an astronaut through the lens of a military aviator, and then you go on and you become the shuttle commander or the pilot. And so I was just living my life doing things until that one person thought of me as an astronaut and said, hey, you should apply. So I opened up the application and I realized that I was highly qualified. And like a lot of people, I could have easily just said, I'm a community college professor, they'll never take me. But instead, I said, I heard my dad's voice actually, you know, kind of in my mind saying, don't talk yourself out of opportunity. Let somebody else decide whether you're qualified or not. And so I applied and I ended up being a finalist for the 2009 NASA astronaut selection process. And that really rekindled my love of aviation and aerospace. And, and so then, after I got that no phone call, you come this close to achieving your life your childhood dream and you're crushed. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm not good enough. What can I do to make myself better? And then I stopped and I said, well, I may not make it to space, but I can still be a part of the advancement of human space flight. And that's why I became an analog astronaut, living in moon and Mars simulations. When you get those no's, you figure out ways to get around that and move forward. Now, NASA has selected more astronaut classes, and in 2019, they put out another call for astronauts. And a bunch of people said to me, did you apply, did you apply? Well, I knew now I was getting a little bit old. I was at 49, almost 50. And I told, this is exactly what I said to them. I said, no, I didn't apply for the NASA astronaut selection process this round. I don't think that's the route for me. But maybe one day, commercial space. And in my head, I was thinking 10 years out, there was going to be commercial space, and I would be able to do that. And then before I knew it, Inspiration4 came along. Now, how many of you heard about Inspiration4? How many of you watched the Super Bowl? Raise your hand. OK, now how many of you remember the Super Bowl ad for Inspiration4? Or were you taking a bathroom break? Raise your hand if you actually remember <laughs> the, the and, and now out of those that you remember, tell me if you actually applied for the inspiration for by buying a seat for a gen generosity, by donating to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Okay, we just have a few people. And so this was one of those things, this opportunity to go to space. Now let me ask you this, how many of you would, would take a trip to space? Raise your hand. Now look at that. Look at how many people just raised their hand if they could go to space, but then think about how many of you actually knew that this was going on and actually put your name in to try to win that seat. Now there were two seats that were being given out. One was the generosity seat. If you donated to St. Jude, all you had to do was donate money and your name was in the running. And the second one was the prosperity seat, where you actually had to do a little more work. You had to show your entrepreneurial spirit 
and you had to be on Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? <laughs> How many of you knew that this was happening, that there was a Twitter contest to win your way to space? 200 people, 200 people entered the prosperity seat. How many of you now wish you were on Twitter? <laughs> a one in 200 chance to go to space. When will that happen again? And so luckily, I've been on Twitter since like 2008. I'm an early adopter of technology. But, um, and, it, and so I saw somebody, I didn't see the Super Bowl ad, I didn't even know. But I had friends who told me about the generosity seat. And I was like, okay, I can give money. But then I was on Twitter and I saw another person's video. And I thought, wait, there's another seat? And then I did some digging and I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. You have to show your entrepreneurial spirit. And I was like, all right, I just became a space artist during COVID. That's another whole story of how you become a space artist during COVID. And I thought, well, I will show my entrepreneurial spirit through that. And luckily, out of 200 people, I won the prosperity seat. Now, that was in the beginning of March. <laughs> Thank you. So imagine you find out that you're the winner, that golden ticket, that Willy Wonka moment, and then they say, okay, you, Jared said to me, I think you would be the perfect person to be my mission pilot. And if you've seen the Netflix, I started crying. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that you want me to fly a dragon capsule to space. I'm like, I don't even know how to do that, but I'm willing to learn. And so um, one of the key things that made me unique about applying for the prosperity seat is that I could have said I want to go as a geoscientist. I want to go because I was almost a NASA astronaut. But instead I said, you know, I just became a space, I just became a space artist. And I think that you need to send an artist and a poet. And in my mind, I kept thinking about the movie Contact. How many of you have seen the movie Contact? That moment when Jodie Foster's floating there and she says, they should have sent a poet. And I thought to myself, I've been the scientist. It's always going to be a part of me. But what about this art side? What about the hum humanity side of space? And so I was able, that was a picture of my, my art there. And I was thinking, okay, if I can go as an artist and a poet, what does that mean for me when it comes to representation and why representation matters? There have only been four, well, before me, there were three black female astronauts, the three that are shown on the screen here. Dr. Mae Jameson was the first. And when you think about representation matters, three in the history, and then I became number four. And so when I think about the fact that there have not been a lot of people to space, but there's not been a lot of people of color who have gone to space, and what does that mean? And then when you think about becoming the pilot of the spacecraft, had I gone a traditional route of NASA, there was probably no chance that I would have ever been assigned as the pilot of the spacecraft. But through the civilian lens, I was able to not only go to space and become the fourth black female to do so, I also became the first black female pilot of a spacecraft in human history as a result of that. So it was really important to me to think about, we are writing the narrative of human space flight right now. We are deciding who's going and who's not. We're deciding what that's gonna look like culturally through the art and the poetry and the writing and the pictures and everything that we're doing as we advance human spaceflight. And so for me, I was thinking, well, if we're going to do this, the first thing that I thought about was Star Trek. How many of you watched William Shatner um, go to space today? That Captain Kirk went to space. And I grew up a Trekkie. How many of you are Trekkies? 
Oh, the rest of you are Star Wars? <laughs> you can be both, a Jedi space, right? A just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space. And for me, I think back to the fact that as a child, how much Star Trek influenced me. And it wasn't Captain Kirk. It wasn't Captain Kirk. It was Lieutenant O'Hara. Because I saw myself through her. I saw myself being able to go through space through her as a little girl, and that matters. And so I was able to go through this amazing astronaut training over the past six months. Um, we, we did crew cohesion, we did flying. Being Jared Isaacman's pilot uh, has been the best experience of my life because he is such a good seasoned pilot himself and I learned so much just flying across country with him and then also in the simulation and training. But what was the best part about going to space? People ask me, what was it that you loved the most? You guys can probably guess. It was the view. When we opened up that cupola, and what most people don't realize is that you could slide up into it, and when you did, I guessed, because you could see the entire sphere of the Earth. But you could also see things like the moon. And in that photo, do you see the moon? The moon rise from around the Earth was amazing. It was such a breathtaking experience. And then the views of our planet. We, we joked that every time we saw land, we were normally over Australia, but we did catch a little bit of South America there. But just the amazing colors, it was a portrait in motion for me. Things like lightning in space and our cities lit up. It, all of the white dots that you see, that's lightning going off as flashes. And then that yellow hue of us, humans living on our planet and working. And here we are in space, living, working, and playing. But the best thing that I was able to do while I was in space was one float that Neil Armstrong autograph that my dad got when he was working for the Apollo to bring my parents, both of who have passed away along with me on this journey, was the most special thing that I could have done. And then I got a chance to paint in space which was also an amazing experience as an artist. And so when I think about space in the old way, I think of exclusive and competitive. And then when I think of new space, this new way, it's inclusive and it's complementary as we, as we strive for this Jedi space, right? This just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space that we all want. And I just want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. One is the Netflix series. If you haven't seen it, raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, there's a few people who've seen it. Um, I encourage you to watch it because it really shows our journey from the beginning all the way to the end and splashdown. And spoiler alert, for those of you that haven't seen it, we made it. <laughs> We were successful because we know we always hold our breath, right? When anybody goes up, how many of you watch Shatner? And you're like, oh my goodness, I hope this works out okay. He's 90, right? We were thinking that, right? Oh, you know? Um, and so it was this six month journey from selection to orbit. And to me, that's a, that's a testament to where we're going in the industry when we think about access an opportunity for all of you that raised your hand and want to go to space, don't give up. Because if I could make it at 51, you can make it at whatever age you are. So keep hanging in there. And use your unique space to inspire those within your reach and beyond. Thank you. for watching this AIN video. Please like, subscribe, and share it if you've enjoyed it. Also, visit AINonline.com for all the latest on the aviation industry.